But in addition to their eating, their other behaviors also did incredible things. Wallowing. They had this habit of going just wallowing around in, in the, on the ground. And uh, there's been a, so much research done on bison, and we've gone through a lot of the literature um, as we're thinking about this. How is this going to work? Is it going to add value to the prairie? Just focusing on their wallows. So you have this 1,500-pound to 200,000-pound animal rolling around in the ground. And what that does is it makes these little depressions and it gets down to mineral soil. If you're a seed on a prairie without wallows and you're trying to get yourself down to mineral soil, your chances of making it down there and germinating are pretty slim, right? You need, to, you need disturbance there. And that's what the bison do. They provide that disturbance so the mineral soil. So seeds can get um, uh, hit the mineral soil and start growing. Being a 2,000 pound animal rolling on the ground, the soil here is gonna be compacted and the water tends to pool in these, providing drinking water for the other animals that you share in the prairie. And actually, um, it also provides a breeding habitat for the frogs and toads that are out there as well. So they, it just another example of the, the, the impact that they have. And it, again, there's a whole slew of research on here some of the other things, the seeds cling to the, their fur and they distribute the seeds across the prairie habitat. Um, they're scat. There's, believe it or not, there's been a lot of research on bison scat that provides habitat for insects, helps disperse seeds, and helps to cycle nutrients on the prairie. Grassland birds use bison fur for their nest. Imagine being a little tiny bird without feathers and you're laying in this a bed of bison fur. And then rubbing their horns helps to minimize the woody plant encroachment on the prairie. So they just have an incredible impact. That's what we're aiming to, to uh, add back into the prairie, at least at Spring Lake Park Reserve. So again, there's if anybody wants uh, any literature on bison, I have tons and tons of it. We wanted to make sure that we were very thoughtful about this because you imagine if you have even 10, 2,000 pound animals out there in the prairie, you do it right. And so we, we've done a lot of research, spent three years making sure that we have a pretty good understanding of what we're doing. And we're the, um, we have existing documents that support us in this as well. Our Bible, if you will, our marching orders for the Natural Resource Program comes from something called the Natural Resource Management Plan which was put together back in 2017. And there's just a couple passages I wanna share with you that support this idea of reintroducing bison. Maintaining appropriate ecosystem disturbances to perpetuate a diverse and resilient plant community. Most ecosystems need some type of disturbance that removes dead plant material, regenerates many plant species, and opens up new habitats for plants and animals to perpetuate themselves or to maintain diversity. Bison fit that perfectly. And then the, the second one is to reintroduce select wildlife species that are not currently living in the park, but once did, which cover the bison. It covers the regal fritillary and many other species that we're, we're not just focusing on the bison. Again, we're trying to knit together these systems. So let, let's get down to it. This is the Western part of Spring Lake Park Reserve. We looked at every park. We had representatives from the DNR that came with us and looked at each park and figured out which one is going to work the best. And we decided that Spring Lake Park was going to be the, the location. Just to orient you a little bit, this Mississippi River up here, this is north. End of the park is here, all over here without me screwing anything up. The fertilizer plant mosaic is over that way. Um, there's about 150 acres of restored prairie. The Mississippi River Regional Trail in orange kind of winds its way through there, which made putting together their range pretty complicated because we looked into, well, let's move the trail. That was way too expensive. So we had to uh, design the range with that trail in mind. And actually it's, it's gonna work well because depending on where the bison are at, uh, people are gonna have some pretty good views of them utilizing the trail there. So there is a, a Western area, if you will, there's a central area and um, an eastern area. 
the design has changed a little bit since this was put together. There are actually eight paddocks um, that uh, that the bison will be in. And um, what else here? Yeah, I think that's it. So the design, we had a consultant team that advised us on it on putting this whole thing together. And uh, we really had in mind, it was important value for us to maintain the health and safety of the bison. It was interesting, I had a, a story map that I put out, maybe some of you saw this for a couple of years, getting input from people. And it was interesting, we had over 500 people that looked at it and took the survey after. And the number one concern that people had was the safety of the bison. People didn't care about people. They, they wanted to make sure that the bison were uh, being, that were kept safe and healthy. So that was great to hear. We have a, a watering system that's going in right now. Again, when this design was put together, uh, we thought it was gonna be too expensive to put water in each of the paddocks that were winterized. So we thought the winterized water would be in blue. So the bison would have to hang out here in the winter every year. Since that time, it was, um, as expensive, least expensive, to winterize all of the watering uh, facilities here. So we have one well up here at the Y camp, one well here that was capped and we reinvigorated that. So each of the paddocks will have, we have the flexibility of having the bison in each of the paddocks uh, throughout the winter and they will have access to water. Even though out when they're out wandering around, they get most of their water in the winter from the snow. We can't always contact snow. And then it's just a, um, the design of the fence. It's a woven wire system. It's six feet high. Um, another value of ours was we didn't want the fence to be a barrier for other wildlife out there. In this park, we have many uh, camera traps and we have great photo documentation of badger out here and fisher and all sorts of animals. We didn't want this to be a barrier for them. So again, we had a way safety of people um, and against that was having it permeable so species could go through it. So where there's the trail, there's six inches between the ground and the fence, which fox get underneath there, rabbits, squirrels, that sort of thing. Where it, when it isn't by a trail, then it's up to a foot and we get some larger animals up there. Deer can easily hop over a six foot fence and the fence has been up. And I'll show you a picture of the, oops. That's what the fence looks like. Again, it's six feet high, it's woven wire. Believe it or not, a 2,000 pound bison standing can jump six feet into the air. They can run 40 miles an hour, they can outrun a horse. And so they're incredible animals. Um, as you can see, well, what, what is this flimsy fence gonna do against a 2,000 pound animal? They could go right through it if they want to. It's a visual barrier. We've contacted um, many practitioners throughout the Midwest that have bison and rarely do they get out. It's usually human error. Oops, I left the gate open. Or there's a couple of them during the rut where the males are kind of joshing each other around and once get put, pushed through the fence. But they're true herd animals. They want to be together. They don't want to be separate. And so if an animal gets out, what people have been telling me is what they're going to be doing if it got out right here. They'd be walking back and forth trying to figure out how do I get back in there with my friends and my family. There are, to facilitate that, we have incorporated 38 to 40, I forget the exact number, uh, gates that are out there. So again, if one of the little darlings gets out here, um, we can apply a little pressure, open up this gate, for instance, and just usher it back in, in with its buddies. If the whole herd gets out, I have my retirement letter already. <laughs> and... Uh, I'm gonna put it in the mail and say, I'd, I'd love to help you, but I'm retired. <laughs> that's not gonna happen. <laughs> but, you know, that's what keeps me up at night. But again, from the DNR, we've contacted people all over the Midwest and they just say, it's never been a problem. We've had places that have had bison for 15, 20 years and they've never had an escape. If you have enough food, if you have water and a social structure, 
They have no interest in going anywhere. You probably heard horror stories from out west, Yellowstone. We have the, it's the people that if there's gonna be a problem, it's gonna be the people who wanna put their kid on the back to get a selfie or, or something, you know, so that it's, that's what we're gonna to have to watch out for. So what's been wonderful the last three years working on this is it's a great opportunity for us to do research. You know, there's the theory about what we think is gonna happen. And what we've been doing is, um, really ramping up on our monitoring and survey work. So we have all sorts of transects out there documenting what plants are there in various places. And so that we can track it over time. We know what's out there now. And then once the bison are, or the treatment, once the bison put out there, we'll follow it to see what sort of impact are they having on the plants out there. In addition, we've been doing a lot of animal surveys. Again, prior to treatment, we've been going out and doing bee surveys and breeding bird surveys, small mammal surveys. We have a pretty good sense of the wildlife that's out there. That's how we found out that the uh, lead plant moth is there. And we'll continue to do these surveys once the bison are in place to see what sort of impact they're having. Are they having the impact that we thought they were going to have? Uh, we will soon find out. It's a great opportunity for us to do research on these animals. Uh, we recently had a discussion with a professor down at Carleton College, who especially is working on grazing and prairie, and he's going to have one of his research uh, areas within the park as well. So we're, this is what really gets us excited about this, is, is the impact these bison are going to have. So um, as I said before, we, we've done a lot of research. We're putting together a lot of plans. We have a grazing plan in place, so we know where the bison are going to be. Um, we, we know what um, the carrying capacity is. We're going to have no more than 15 animals out there at one time. So we're going to have to um, call the herd at some point. Um, we are putting together an operational plan, both from the parks operation, park visitors, signage, and, and all that sort of thing. Bison operations, how do we move them from place to place? I've just completed the first draft of our uh, escape plan, even though you heard me say it's never going to happen. If it does, we have a plan for it. Uh, and we have engaged the both the sheriff's office and the Rosemont uh, police in this as well. And we have an interpret interpretation plan. We are part, we have joined the Minnesota Bison Conservation Herd, which is a partnership that is trying to establish a statewide herd of 500 animals that have no detectable cattle genes in them. So we even maximum we'll have 15 animals out here. We're a small piece of that, but we're a part of this larger organization that includes the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, the Minnesota Zoo, the Zolman Zoo down in Rochester, and the Metawakanton Sioux community in Shakopee is, um, they're looking and joining it as well. So the, the partnership I think is growing. It's, we also see it as a great opportunity to, um, to engage the local indigenous communities in this. Over thousands of years, the bison and the um, indigenous people of this area had a really close relationship. It, it, they, uh, in this book, is interesting. If you ever get a hold of a copy of Thomas Mayo's Mystic Warriors of the Plains, um, it, sometimes it was difficult to tell the difference between the bison community and the, the human community. They were that close. And it was a great quote for them. So this is our opportunity. Uh, we have sent letters to both the uh, Shakopee Metawakanton Sioux community and the Prairie Island Indian community, asking them if they're interested in being involved in this project, and if so, how. And then there's also opportunities for volunteers. We're gonna to continue to increase the plant diversity out there. So there are opportunities to help us not only grow these uh, plants, but going out and helping us to install them. This is last fall and before the fence was up in this one paddock, the um, 
National Park Service nonprofit partner, if you will, is the M Mississippi River Connection. They brought some volunteers down and we installed, installed several hundred uh, Forbes out into this prairie. We also are starting something called the Bison Buddies, for lack of a better term, volunteers that would be interested in being out there and just having their eyes not only on the bison, but all the park visitors as well, making sure everything is fine. And then um, if, there are, if there are people interested in helping us to do educational and interpretive stuff for people, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to come out to this park wanting to see the bison. It's a great opportunity for us to educate them, not only about the bison, but also about the, the prairie community, because it really is about that. So what are the next steps? Uh, the design has been done. We hope to complete construction of the fencing and the handling facility, all of that by midsummer. We will continue to do our uh, surveys of plant and animals, and the bison will arise sometime in the fall of 2022. One of the things that, there's a lot of excitement around this, and I've been trying to have people within Dakota County kind of curb their enthusiasm a little bit, because when the bison arrive, I want them to have a month, a month and a half of being off by themselves, acclimating to their new home. So there isn't a lot of people around causing undue stress. They're gonna be stressed a little bit anyway, because they're in a new place. We're probably not gonna have a grand opening in the fall of 22. We'll probably have something in the spring of 23. Once they have a chance to, you know, again, figure out where they are and acclimate to where they are, that sort of thing. That's not to mean that you can't see them. They will be out, they're gonna be here all year. They're gonna be Dakota counties. They'll be out there in winter, spring, summer, and fall. And what's exciting, um, we're probably gonna get a couple of cows and at least one of those cows will probably be pregnant. So my guess is in the spring of 23, we might have a calf out there. Wouldn't that be cool? So with that, I don't know how much time I took, maybe too much, maybe not enough, but that's all I have. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to, uh, to answer some of them. Oh my goodness, look at them all. <laughs> I would be happy to do that. Yes. Do you want me to? So I was asked uh, if we know what the ratio of male to females will be. The, the first group of animals that we get, which will be culled from the state parks, Minneopa State Park, Blue Mounds, and maybe one or two from the Minnesota, Minnesota Zoo, will all be female. They will likely be, um, we're having a meeting this coming week, so I, I don't know exactly, but likely a couple of cows, maybe a couple of yearlings, maybe a cow calf, probably get six. We're not gonna introduce a bull, get those males involved and all hell breaks loose. <laughs> um, we're probably not going to um, have a male join the herd for maybe another year or a year and a half. And so we, we see it as um, a reproducing herd. You know, we want it to be as a natural herd as possible. So starting out, I don't think we'll have any males involved. If the cow is pregnant and gives birth to a male, he will be able to stay with the herd for two years. Once he becomes breeding age, he will have to go, or his mom will have to go, or his sister, because we don't want there to be any interbreeding, that sort of thing. There is somebody at the Minnesota Zoo that keeps the stud book and knows where everybody came from and who's mating with who and all that sort of thing. I'm glad I don't have to keep, what's that? Uh, <laughs> no, it's not, but that's just one of the services they're providing to us. Yeah. That's what they're called. Right? Yeah, it's, yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, so I told you the, uh, the question was, are there other bison herds in Minnesota? There's kind of two 
um, forms of it, I guess. We, the Blue Bound State Park, Minneopolis State Park have a couple hundred bison that wander around their prairie. And then there's two zoos that have them. That's a part of the Minnesota Bison Conservation Herd. Now, there is, I'll forget the organization, I'm so old now, um, Bellwin Conservancy up near Afton. They have a herd that a private a bison herd brings them in just in the summer. They basically are raising them for, beet, for meat. So they, go, they graze all summer and they take them away and, and do what they do is slaughter them or something at the end. Uh, Cedar Creek Research Area of the University of Minnesota, north of the cities, also utilizes that same vendor to bring bison in. They're doing research on bison and oak savannas. So again, they're there just during the, um, okay, with the look on your face, I gotta explain that. So Cedar Creek has been up there for a long, long time. They've been doing research. Uh, it's used natural resource research facility. And they've been having problems with um, perpetuating the oak savanna. And what they found was that, you know, fires were a part of the oak savanna as much as they were a part of the prairie. As you can imagine these fires, coming up through the prairie and they would slam into the uh, deciduous forest and that, and the, the trees that had thin bark would die, the maples and birches would die. The trees that had nice thick bark like the white oak and bur oak would survive. And so that's where you get the oak savanna, which is, you know, it's prairie with maybe five or six or seven oaks per acre there. So they've been doing research on this. But they found that the fires that they used were killing the young oaks coming up. And so their thought was, well, if we added grazing, the bison would keep the fuel low, load so low that when we did fire, it, it wouldn't be hot enough to kill the young oak. And so this is the second year. Actually, they're going into their third year. And I don't know if they've come to any conclusions on that. But getting back to your question, there is um, that herd there. So you see there's this kind of um, temporary herds that people are utilizing for research or for meat. And then there's those that have joined the, um, the Minnesota Bison Conservation Herd. I guess the third is some of the um, indigenous communities like Prairie Island also have a herd down there as well. And they use that for ceremonial as well as for food. Those are the ones that I'm aware of. Yeah, I'm curious about the herd that is in uh, Teddy Roosevelt National Park. Yeah. Yes. And their herd is not No. Yeah, and they don't, yeah, they, they, you know, it's huge, but I mean, you weren't that far from them. When you have these, <laughs> the, so I'll address that in a second. The herd at Yellowstone has been living in that area consistently for the last thousand, two thousand years. That at one point, the numbers were down in North America, probably to a couple hundred bison. And some of those bison were brought in by ranchers that thought, well, we can maybe get the best of both by breeding them with cattle. That didn't work very well, but what it did is it did perpetuate the genetics of, of the bison. And so I say, you have a hard time finding a bison that doesn't have some genetics of cattle in them. If you have a large enough area, if we had Dakota County that was just prairie, we could just let the bison roam around. The neighbors probably wouldn't be too cool about that. And so I camped out at Teddy Roosevelt and I remember laying in my tent that in the morning and I could hear the bison around my tent snuffling and eating. It's kind of intimidating, but yeah, but they're, they're not a predator. They don't care about us. As long as you don't bug them, like bugging their young, they're going to leave you alone. We're not banking on that. That's why we have the fence. But I, that's the only way I can answer it. I'm just curious about the herd. It's a pretty populated park. 
It is, and it's even going to be more so. Yeah. The uh, mini, uh, mini Opa State Park saw a 70% increase in the park once they brought the bison in. Yeah. So we don't, you know, we're increasing the size of our parking, having discussions with the local units of government about you know, people are going to park along the road. We know it's going to increase. We don't know how much. So stay I'm tuned. Assuming there's product. Yes, there will be. Yes. Yep. Yes, sir. That's yeah, University of Minnesota at the Cedar Creek. I think it's Cedar Creek Natural Area. It's the Use Research Facility just north of the Twin Cities. I know a little bit about that, enough yeah, to be yeah. dangerous. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, something that may be just as good or gosh darn near as good would be cattle. Is there a cattle rancher in the area that we would be willing to bring his cattle in for the summer, for instance? Goats. Yep. We yeah we have goats at Lebanon Hills. We have goats in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's. I was going into it when I was just a young bison person. <laughs> You know, it's funny because I've become the, the county expert on them. I know squat about bison. Only through this process have I learned about them. So anyway, I went into this second five acres per bison. That's what some of the research showed me, but that, that's really the long, long way to look at it. We have done several years of forage analysis to try to figure out how much nutrition is there in it. And there's calculations that uh, farmers and, and ranchers use all the time. The maximum number of animal units we'll have out there will be 15. That's going into it. We're going to be, as I said, we're going to be monitoring their impact. If we find out that they're having too much of an impact, we may have to reduce that down a little bit. Or if we'd like to see more of an impact, maybe we can increase it a few animals. We're going into it thinking that 15 animals is the limit that we will have. Any other questions? Yes, yes. Um, there we There are. Uh, Canada has. Can you, can you repeat this question? Because I couldn't hear that. Yes. Uh, this gentleman was saying that there were two, there are subspecies of bison in North America. There was the woodland bison, Athaba bison Athabasca, I think. And then there was the um, plains bison. And the question was are there still some of the woodland bison here? And the, the Canada has a couple of parks that do have the woodland bison in them. We have the bison, 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 which is the species genus and subspecies or subgenus or subspecies name of it. So um, the answer to your question is yes. Why well, couldn't just. I don't know much about them, to be honest with you. I had to keep my inquiry to the bison, bison, bison. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's better than what some people call me, so let's go with that. Yes, way in the back, yes. The question was, are we going to have an observation area for people to view the bison. The problem is, it's not really a problem. The situation is going to be, let, I, I withdraw that, but situation is, so when the bison arrive, here's, here's trucks pulling in, uh, 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 they get off, and they're going to spend the first winter over here, off by themselves, watching TV, I don't know what bison do in the winter, doing whatever. And then the grazing plan will say, oh, I don't know, 
I'm making this up as I go along. So the following spring, we may move them into this area. This is the entrance into the park off of Fahey. And there is a parking area here. We're increasing, we're doubling that size. So there's probably a place enough for maybe a hundred cars. And there's, they're out there building it right now. There's gonna be a trail that comes down along here and there's gonna be a viewing platform right here, which is great if the bison are in here, right? If the bison are over, over here, you're gonna be sitting over here saying, yeah, I don't know what's so cool about this. I can't see the gosh darn things. Um, so the answer to your question is yes. And we're building one right now. The master plan, which we finished last year, does call for other observation areas. Uh, there is a plan for an interpretive center that will interpret not only bison in the prairie, but also the Mississippi River ecosystem in this area with parking and there'll be an observation area associated with that. In the near future, it'll just be this one, or you're gonna have to jump on the trail and uh, maybe you know, be able to see them from the trail area. More The question was, is there, who do we reach out to if we want to volunteer? If you're volunteering to bring me coffee in the morning, you can directly email me. Uh, Robert, I believe has my email address, do you not? Um, so if you want to get a hold of Robert and get it to me, the county has a volunteer coordinator. And so I'll get it to the right person. But if you want to send me all of your um, information, I left my uh, briefcase with all my cards in it. Unfortunately, it's at home, but as I said, we do have my contact information in the organization and you can contact me that way. If, uh, if any of you are trail monitors, we have, I don't know, 60 or 70 volunteers that are trail monitors. There is a subset of those that would wanna be trail monitors out here that will you go up and down the trail, making sure someone's not sticking their neck through the fence or, or just providing some basic interpretation about the bison. Um, you know, starting like right now, we have signs out there saying, hey, the bison are going to be here in the fall. So people are asking questions about it. But we'd love to have you join us. There's going to be a lot to do. We can't have staff out there 24-7. We're not going to be able to have volunteers out there 24-7. But as much as we can have people out there uh, with their eyes and ears open watching, that will be great. Miniope has a very robust bison bass ambassador program that share information about them and keep their eyes on them as well. We'd like to have something similar to that. We'll have a recap. We'll send out the email address and email address. Brenda, can you put that in the chat? Anybody else have a question? Yes. What, what exactly does a bison technician do? What, how will they monitor what bison are? She wants to become one. <laughs> <laughs> we, we hired um, a wonderful young woman, Carly Dulick, who grew up on a cattle farm and she has a, a degree in wildlife biology from the University of Minnesota. We, the ideal was to have somebody with bison experience and wildlife and natural resource experience. You, you don't always get what you want, but Carly, is an incredible young woman. And so what her job will be is um, monitoring the bison. In the winter, we'll have to feed them. She just got her CDL, so she will, this is gonna get kind of into the weeds. But so when we wanna move the little darlings, say from this uh, paddock area over to here, we're gonna have to close off the, the trail. And they're going to have to go from this paddock across the trail into what this kind of, it's a migration corridor, if you will. And we have these standalone gates that we're going to have to put up so that the bison only go where we want them to go. So she's got to get in her skid steer and move these big things around. She will, she will be working with the bison on a daily basis.
basis, as well as going around the making sure that the fence is all there, that a tree hasn't fallen on them, wrestling people who are trying to climb over the fence, all those things, uh, helping the natural resource specialist. You know, we still have to do management in the prairie. We still have to burn it. We still have to control some of the exotic invasive species in there. She will be uh, kind of heading all of that up. That's only half of her time. The other half of her time is natural resource technician helping with other projects within the, the county park system. <laughs> yes, so um, I so the question was, where are the where's the money coming for this? I applied to the uh, LCCMR, which is I'll try to get this right, the Legislative Citizens Commission on Minnesota Resources, uh, and they provide recommend recommendations to the Minnesota Legislature about how to spend the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. When you buy a lottery ticket, that's where that, and some other, I don't know if there's tobacco uh, sales or something that goes into this fund, LCCMR recommends that. Anyway, so I applied to them and they gave us a grant of $560,000 to go towards this, which is essentially helping us to put all the fencing in, it's helping us to put all the water in, it's uh, building us, is that me? It's helping me to put together a, uh, a handling facility. There is some county dollars in there, and uh, but I, I don't know exactly. There, there is a, um, a unit in Dakota County called uh, Capital Projects Management. They're not gonna let a knucklehead like me manage all of this. They do all of that. So I don't know what the exact budget is, but well over a half of that came from this state grant. And I could get specifics. I'm not trying to be coy about that or anything. I, yeah. That yeah, we have over six miles of fence out there. Yes. Yeah. Right. Somebody on the internet. Joan, actually. You want to come listen, Max? You can listen to this. There is a website. If you go to the county's website. <laughs> And you scroll all the way down to the bottom. There is a uh, a page for Dakota County Parks. And if you go into that, you will find it's not intuitive, but if you go into that, there is a page for the Bison Project. I don't know when the last time it's been updated, but you get some basic information there. And as we approach October, when again the little darlings are going to show up, we'll have more um, be coming in in more up to date information about that. Yes. Where's the set? Naming snowplows. Did you ever raise awareness of the naming of the bison, sending that out like we did with the snowplow naming season? Well, I can tell this answer is not going to be popular. So I, I'm going to give you my personal opinion, not my professional one. I don't want to name these things because at some point they're going to have to be called and they're going to have to be killed. And you put your name on it and it becomes yours. And it's really, really difficult from a public relations standpoint then to take the steps that you need to do. They're, they're going to have to be called. You know, there, there's really no way around that. So I'm sure people will do that anyway. If we have a young one out there next spring, people are going to name it Little Darling and all these things, but we're not going to have official names for them. I apologize if that doesn't make you happy, but. Um, they're going to get used to people. Are you going to try to prevent them getting used to people? I can just see kids trying to see grass through the fence because of the little bison. <laughs> That's what keeps me awake at night. Yeah. <laughs> they're, as I said, we're getting them from most of them from the state parks and the zoo. And there's people, if you've ever been to Minneopolis State Park, you can drive through the range with your car. These are not coming from Yellowstone or something that they have never seen people. They've been around people, so they shouldn't freak out too much. It, um, yeah, it's managing the people that's going to be, yeah, so I, their parents, I'm going to have to have a stern talking to their parents. 
only this initial time, maybe that first month when they get there because they are gonna be stressed, it's new surroundings, and I don't want to uh, stress them out any more than they're going to be. Other than that, no, they, they may be 10 feet from the fence, and uh, you may be 10 feet from the fence, you get up close, look at them. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, I'm not sure I deserve that, but thank you so much for allowing me to come here. This is my birthday, and I can't imagine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I can't imagine a better way to spend it than than out here talking about this. I can I can talk about bison for for hours and hours. So thank you for the invite.